Welcome once again to Arizona Conference 2021 Virtual Camp Meeting. It is a pleasure to be the host of this event. We've had some beautiful music, wonderful messages. We're so glad each of you are joining by Good News TV and by other means. I want to share with you, uh, of course, you can watch by YouTube or Facebook Live, but the uh, website that you're looking for is facebook.com, G-N-T-V-A-Z, uh, or you can look up mygoodnewstv.com slash camp or youtube.com slash goodnewstvaz. So and those are the ways you can watch our special virtual camp meeting. And we're so glad so many have joined us here at our venue as well. And we thank the local church here. And I've been trying to keep it as quiet as possible, but people are texting me, are you at Camelback Church? And I said, well, I'm not going to answer that. I give the CIA, I will neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> now, we're glad you're here today. My wife, oh, by the way, I'm Ed Keyes, president of the Arizona Conference. This is my wife, Lillian. We're so thankful we have an opportunity to welcome you today. It is our pleasure to be here and to really celebrate this beautiful Sabbath day here in Phoenix, Arizona, actually Scottsdale, Arizona. We just want to praise the Lord for how he has just poured out his spirit. We're so thankful for our speakers. What a blessing you've been to each one of us, how God has used you. So we hope that all of you who are watching come and, and join us again today as we praise God on his beautiful Sabbath. Amen. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all that you do for us. And we thank you, Lord, for the way that you've been inspiring us and motivating us through our speakers, through the musicians that have shared with their talent. And Father, we pray that you continue to bless us again today. Father, bring us close to your throne and help us that when this day is done, we will be motivated to move out into our community to reach people with the wonderful good news of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. I'm Pastor Ed Anderson here in Phoenix, Arizona, the Arizona Conference. We're doing a baptism. It's historical, the very first time here on the Salt River. We have 35 baptisms, and the Holy Spirit is working. The latter rain is occurring. Jesus is coming soon. Today we're going to have it happen with our conference president, Ed Keyes, our ministerial secretary, Jorge Ramirez, and myself. So we are so thankful that, that this is happening today, and we just have to say praise the Lord. special event to have these individuals, both young and old, say yes to Jesus. They want to follow Jesus with all their heart. I want to tell you, whoever's listening at home, whoever's watching this, that is the best decision you can make. We thank the Lord for the Chandler English Church and the Chandler Phil Am Church that joined together today for this special event. God bless you, God keep you, and keep you safe. Spirit and that He loves me. Amen. I didn't expect to have like this many people witnessing our baptism, so I believe that like, uh, it's a very special baptism mm -hmm. and just being able to be baptized in the river is just a, a, an emulation of Jesus' baptism that happened in River Jordan. I can't believe what just happened here. You know, the Bible says that in the last days, the Holy Spirit will rain down. And we know that Jesus is coming soon. And today we had 33 baptisms, but five others came from the crowd and said, we want to be baptized. 
I believe that Jesus is coming soon and the Holy Spirit is working on people. People just need the opportunity to give their decisions to Jesus. And this message goes out to everybody watching this video now. Get your life right with God because Jesus is coming soon. And all you have to believe is in Jesus dying for you and taking Jesus into your heart and saying, Lord, I want to have a life in heaven. And I thank you for giving the sacrifice on the cross for me. So be a part of this movement. Jesus is coming soon in these last days. This baptism today out here on the Salt River in Arizona is evidence that we're near the end. And the people said, we're going to sing about this hope, that all this is about. Let's sing together, we have this hope, and pay attention to the second stanza, because it's not going to be in any hymn book. So just follow along. Here we go. again. It's a beautiful Sabbath day. It's good to be here. Um, last week you guys heard from a guy named Steve who was uh, the chair of Arizona Sunshine and he told you this week that I would be coming and talking to you uh, as the new chair of Arizona Sunshine. So I, I did promise to show up. So um, I want to share, I, I believe he set this up as I'm going to tell you the history and then what's going forward. I'm going to abbreviate that a little bit. This is actually, I think, year seven. We had to skip a year of doing it because of this thing called COVID. So um, we're just going to keep moving on because we found that as we did it last week, uh, people still need help and people still come and we still get extremely blessed by being there and participating. So um, 
first off, if you haven't done it before, I'm going to try to encourage you to do it in the future. And um, I shared this earlier, and I'm going to share it again because I don't think we can hear this enough. Uh, it doesn't uh, eliminate anything else that we need to be doing, but um, I like this quote. It's from one of my favorite writers named Ellen G. White. She wrote it quite a while back. Very important. It says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with people as one who desired their good. He showed sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence. Then he invited them, follow me. We need to come close to the people by personal effort. If we would give less time to sermonizing and more time to personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, the inexperienced counsel counseled. We are to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice, accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, this work will not, cannot be without fruit. I've uh, given this a lot of thought, and I, I shared with some other people that that is what I believe. I believe it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that we can share that. That doesn't mean we need to stop all the other things that we do. But sometimes when we meet people, and I am really tired of meeting people in Arizona that have never heard of an Adventist, don't know what we believe, and worse yet, I've met people who have no clue who Jesus Christ is. When I first meet somebody like that, if I tell them about Jesus Christ, they're probably not going to listen to me. But if I show them who he is, now they're interested. If I'm interested in healing them physically, I'm hoping that they will trust us to heal them spiritually. I don't know another way to do it, and I think that's why she said Christ's method alone. We put him first, and everything else follows. So the future of Arizona Sunshine, um, if I have anything to do with it, and I'm going to try, is that in the next few short years, that there will be no one in Arizona, not one single person, that doesn't know who we are, what we believe, and what we stand for. And I believe one of the leading opportunities to do that is through Arizona Sunshine. When we show people we care, they'll believe it. I think it's the best method. I think we need to keep doing everything else, but there's some people that we're just not going to get in touch with unless we show them Jesus first.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's now time for our stewardship education moment, also known as the offering appeal. And I would like to start out by reading a verse, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. First of all, I'd just like to give a huge thank you to all the members of the Arizona Conference. You have been faithful. And how do I know that? Well, I want to give you some information. Yesterday, we finished our May remittance report, and the conference is up 20% in tithe from last year. Now, you may think, well, that's because 2020 was a bad year with COVID and everything. And yes, that's true. We had a bad March and a bad April, but by May, things had bounced back to almost even. So we're 20 percent above 2019. We're 20 percent above 2020. Praise God and thank you for your faithfulness. I want to share a, a quick story here about how we can't outgive God. Just as COVID was starting and as the government was talking about giving out the first stimulus package, I happened to be a member of Arizona Planned Giving Roundtable. And I was at one of our meetings. I can't remember. I think it was the last one we did in person. And one of the people who was presenting stood up and said, you know, our organization has had this great idea. We're going to our donors and encouraging them to give their stimulus to charity. You see, about half of the people who received the stimulus weren't seriously affected by COVID. And so for those half of the people, it was really just a bonus in their checking account. So we're encouraging them to give that back to charity. And I thought, what a great idea. We should do that with our, our members and our congregations as well. So I wrote an article that actually happened to be put into the Pacific Union Recorder. And a few days after that, one of my colleagues in the office came up to me and said, Reggie, I was so inspired by that article that I'm going to do what you suggested. I'm going to give my $1,400 stimulus back to charities, and some of it's going to go to the church. And I said, great, I'm glad you were inspired by that. Praise God. Well, time went by, and this person came to me again in May. Remember, our tax day got extended from April 15 to May 17. This same person came to me in May, and she said, Reggie, I've got to tell you the rest of the story here. You're not going to believe this. Because I gave that extra $1,400 last year, that pushed me above the $12,000 mark so that I could now itemize my deductions rather than doing the standard deduction. And because of that, I was able to claim enough deductions that I'm now getting a refund of seven or $800 instead of having to pay two or $300 tax. And she said, besides that, I gave part of that money to Arizona Adventist scholarships and I'm getting a dollar-for-dollar dollar refund from the state of Arizona. And I'm actually going to have as much money as I did before. God gave it all back to me. Isn't that amazing? We can't outgive God. Now, I know if you've been with us this week, you heard Elder Ted Huskins give a story on Thursday night also about how you cannot outgive God. And I encourage you, if you weren't able to be here or watch that one, to go back and look at the archived version and, and listen to that story as well, because that's amazing also. I just want to encourage you to continue being faithful. Our offering today is for Arizona Advance, which, go, which goes for evangelism, elementary education, Thunderbird Academy, and Camp Yava Pines. Now, usually at camp meeting, we set a camp meeting goal of $50,000. We didn't do that this year because we're thinking, okay, it's virtual camp meeting. Maybe we can't do that. But I'm going to put that goal in front of you today. I think there may be some of you out there who still have $1,260 of that $1,400 stimulus. Why $1,260? Because you probably paid your tithe on it, and that's probably partly why we're 20% ahead, praise God. But I think there's several of you who could write a $1,260 check. There's other ways to give today. If you're in a local church that's viewing this, your deacons may be ready to wait on you. Praise God for that. If you're watching from home virtually, you can go on Adventist Giving and go to your own church and give to Arizona Advance. 
If you're watching somewhere where you're not part of Adventist giving, you could go onto the Arizona Conference website, and down at the bottom of the main page, there's a Give button, and you can click on that and give through the Conference Church to Arizona Advance today. I just encourage you to continue your faithfulness. We can never be more generous than how much generosity God has shown to us and how much He has blessed us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have blessed us in so many ways, and we are so thankful. And we can show just a little bit of our thankfulness by returning to you what you've blessed us with. It, it all belongs to you anyway, Lord. And so we want to give some of it back to show our love. And so today, Lord, we just ask that you'll bless this offering, that you'll stretch it, and that the ministries that are blessed by it, evangelism, elementary education, Thunderbird, and Camp Yava Pines, will be able to draw people closer to you as a result of what they do with those dollars. May we have additional stories in the future that talk about how people were brought to the foot of the cross as a result of giving that has happened. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Eric. Wow, that was beautiful for us here in person. Very, very beautiful. I'm sure it was beautiful at home as well. I was teasing uh, Dennis earlier. Is he taller than his son or not? I don't know, but he may out-talent you one of these days. This is for sure. The Marsilia family has been a real blessing to the Arizona Conference. Uh, in fact, Claudio led our song service. Uh, that's the brother of Dennis. I don't know which one came first in the order right now. No, I'm just teasing. But I really appreciate Dennis and Claudia and the beautiful music they've shared with us so far. A lot of people coming in on YouTube, and I was told uh, by Luke Skelton, our director of Good News TV, that if you want to put something on there, use the hashtag AZ Camp Meeting 2021. If you use a hashtag, if you're watching uh, by YouTube, put that on there, and we'll, or I should say uh, Facebook, put that on there, and we will certainly try to mention those. Uh, several people have texted me. Vince Wolsey, pastor of the Commonwealth Church, had a baptism during virtual camp meeting. Amen? Well, right in between the two, so uh, Sabbath school and church. So we're really thankful for all who are watching. One of our newest pastor's wives in the conference, Pastor um, Mary Alice, his wife from Chandler Phil Am Church is watching today, and she wanted to give a, a greetings as well. Now, it's my privilege now to introduce our speaker and our musician for this weekend. Sandy told me after I introduced her yesterday, she said, you know, Ed, that kind of sounded like a eulogy, or no, she said that to all of you. You. And I said, okay, I won't do that again. I will tell you, uh, when Phil Draper told me, and I keep mentioning Phil, if he's watching at home, he's going to feel loved. Amen. We really appreciate Phil and Phil and Joey. And um, they would be on that family gathering thing together that they did every year. And we would watch them and listen to them sing beautiful, beautiful music. Well, Sandy, when Phil told me about Sandy coming to camp meeting uh, two years ago, or let's just say last year, and we had to cancel because of the pandemic, he was so disappointed because he really wanted to be here for this. And so I was so glad when Sandy shared last night that those beautiful songs that drew us closer to the throne. And I want to tell you, there have been a lot of people... Uh, chatting, texting, and so forth on Facebook, thanking us for the, for the wonderful messages. But last night I had a number of them thanking us for the beautiful music. So Sandy, welcome again to Arizona Conference Camp Meeting. Even though it's in a virtual format, we're so glad you're with us. After she sings, the next voice you'll hear will be our speaker, Pavel Goya. And I will introduce him as well. He says keep it short, so I'll keep it real short. He is the editor of Ministry Magazine, He's also uh, one of the associate directors for the ministerial department, and I will tell you, when he spoke to our pastors on Friday morning, a very practical ministry ideas. If you want to learn more about how to do ministry, he's a guy to talk to, and his stories have really touched my life. God bless you. Share with us, Sandy, and then Pavel after that. reach from the heavens to the far ends of the earth to give you life forever he left no stone unturned and before the birth of time Jesus had you on his mind so you never need to question his concern so what can separate you from the precious love of God who could ever come against his strong and perfect love so when you're in the valley and your nights are cold and lonely the darkest hour is just before the dawn. Remember, nothing can separate you from God's love. You believe that? Amen. He 
numbers each and every star, and he calls them all by name. He counts them one by one to see that they are still in place. If he cares for every star, then he sees right where you Nothing can separate you, neither death nor sorrow, not today and not tomorrow, nothing past, nothing present, nothing future, nothing Remember who could ever come against his strong and perfect love. So when you're in the valley and your nights are cold and lonely, the darkest hour, it's just be. What a wonderful love. Jesus loves me, this I know. <laughs> it is a privilege for me to be here with you. And I mean it. This is no politics. I have no agenda. I don't like any place better than to be at home with my wife. <laughs> but I tell you, people here are extremely friendly. Now, don't get a big head about it, okay? <laughs> but people here are very friendly friendly, and I am taking care of more than I dream, and I, I even feel bad that I am taking care of so good, you know. <laughs> I want to express my appreciation for all you do to organize it, for the wonderful work that God is doing here, and thank you for inviting me and being patient, because last year it was the virus, the year before, you know, but I am glad to be here. There is one single problem that I have. Next time when you invite me, I got to take my wife. Sure. Amen. <laughs> so what a privilege to be together. Let's start because we have just a little time. And let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the love that surpasses human understanding. The love that nothing can separate us from you. And Father, right now, as we come in your presence in humility, we pray that you may touch our hearts. You that know every heart, you know every need, you know the future, you know what is needed in this area and for all those that listen. Please, touch us that we may see you. In Jesus' name we ask. 
Amen. Jesus is coming. Did you hear during those baptisms? Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? How do you know if you are ready or not? I want to start with a story. I was young. I was a kid, actually. I don't remember. Sixth grade, maybe seventh grade. My father is a man of was, a man of prayer. When I say a man of prayer, more than anybody can imagine. Fully dedicated, fully devoted, no reservation. For many years, when I say many years, not one or two, maybe 20 or more, he would bring every week, every week, Bibles from former Yugoslavia. He welded a double floor to his car, and he would hide the Bibles between the two floors. And at the border, the communist government would search the car everywhere. But they never thought that the floor is thick. <laughs> and he would bring Bibles, and in the night, he would drop them on, for people. And many times he was taken to the police. We got a tip that you bring Bibles. We are going to take your house. I gave it to God. There is nothing to take. I'm going to take your salary. I returned 90% of my 90%, not 10. Little. And he says, there is nothing to take. I keep only 10 for our family because Jesus is coming and I want to invest all in his coming. There is nothing you can take. I have no money. We are going to kill you. Praise the Lord. I'm going to see Jesus. Are you crazy? Yes. <laughs> what a commitment. And I remember we, our church was packed, no room. That's a good problem. And we started to build a new church, but it was against the law. You could not. You could not do that. They will arrest you, and they will torture you, and they will, you will end up in prison, and you will die in prison. And so my father prayed, and then with the pastor, and then with the board, they prayed and prayed, and God inspired them. And they prayed together, and they said, Lord, only in your power you can do this building. We cannot, we may think that we can do it. We so many times trust in our power, but it's not by power, nor by might, it's by my. Everything that we do in this Christian life, everything, every small or big, doesn't matter. It's all by God's power. When you do it in your power, you fail. There is no human power or wisdom or resources that could do God's work. God's work is done in God's power, period. Nothing that you could add to what God does. God doesn't need your help. All that God needs from you is total commitment, total faith, total obedience, and he will do it for you. And so my father and the board, they prayed and prayed, Lord, we need your power. Would you help us build a church, though it's a communist government and we risk our lives? And they decided to leave the front wall of the church and to build a new church behind the front wall, hidden, so nobody could see a building growing. They demolished the rest of the church, and they propped it, the front wall, so it stays. And they started to build. And we would meet at the church, everybody, there was no excuse. In God's work, everybody has to work. There is no lazy Adventist. Who is lazy is not an Adventist. Mm -hmm, you heard me. Young, children, elderly, sick, healthy, rich, poor, educated, not educated, elders, members, doesn't matter. Everybody. We all did something. And we felt blessed to be part of it. And we would meet after 11 p.m., come two, three, not everybody in the same time, so they will not catch us. And we would look through the night without any light, at the moonlight, uh -huh, no power tools, quietly, and around 4 or 5 a.m., we would disappear, evaporate. <laughs> and every night, after about four months, there was a new church that became taller than the front wall. <laughs> and the police came. And they came at the gates and opened the door. And we all got together. What should they do? And my father says, do you have a warrant? No, but we don't need one. Oh, yes, you do. Well, we go back and we'll be back in three hours. God bless you. Go, come with a warrant. We don't open the gates before you bring a warrant. 
And then the whole people got inside the church and we kneeled down. And we prayed. And we prayed and we prayed. And my father said, what are you whining in prayer? Lord, save our lives. Are you concerned with your lives or the church? <laughs> Say, Lord, save our church, not our lives. Aren't you supposed to love Jesus more than you love yourself? Lord, save our church and your honor and your work in this city and let us die for you as Jesus died for us. He prayed. Isn't that something? And people stopped praying for themselves and they started to pray for God's work. And then my father said, folks, if there is something between you and God that you didn't take care of, that would limit God's power and work. Search your hearts. Search me, O oh Lord. You remember? Search your hearts. Because that's what God told Joshua. Consecrate yourselves so tomorrow the Lord could do great things among you. You need to, the way they consecrated themselves in that time, first, they took a shower so they would be clean physically when they go in God's presence, but then they solved the problem between them and the neighbor, between them and God, so there was nothing that could limit God's power working for them. They could not go to war before they would search themselves. And my father said to them, search yourself so there is nothing that will limit God's power here. And there are two families that have been fighting each other for two generations. They spent all their energy and time to fight each other. They didn't admit, but they ate humans. I mean, they ate each other, you know. And so <laughs> my father said, folks, it's time that you solve the problem. Well, it's his fault. Folks, it's our fault, all of us. Nobody is righteous. You're only Jesus. If you argue, you think that you are good, you don't know how you are. And my father went to them and took one and said, Lord, forgive me because I didn't pray enough for them. And they said, now it's your turn. And the guy, whoa, whoa, whoa. it's your turn. He says, Lord, forgive me because I've been so hateful. And the guy started to cry. And the other one came, Lord, forgive me because I've done the same. And they hugged each other and soon enough, the whole church started to ask forgiveness to each other and hug each other and cry. It was a sweet spirit, confession, humbleness. And as we were praying, the police didn't come back. And then we finished the church. Well, well, well. A few months later, they came with bulldozers and the warrant to demolish the church. And as they came to demolish the church, they said, we have a warrant. We are ready to take your building down. And my father said, that's beautiful. Please demolish it. Why are you so happy? Well, we did wrong. We did church within the walls. And God sent us to go in the world to do church. And if you demolish it, we are going to go in the market and preach the whole city. Well, then you watch baptisms. And they started to scratch their heads and they said, this guy is crazy. <laughs> Who is the leader? And my father told the pastor, take your wife and disappear. Go through the back door because you are young. God has a plan for you. I am old. I can go to prison. Go, disappear. The pastor left, and my father said, I'm the leader. You can arrest me. Le leave the others. Go. As soon as my father said, arrest me, there was another elder who stood up. He said, no, no, I'm the leader. Arrest me. And then another one, 270 people stood forward, and they said, I am the leader. And they said, we cannot arrest everybody. We are going to just demolish the church. And my father took mom, myself, and my two sisters and stood in front of the wall and said, when you go to destroy our church, you go to human flesh. We are not going to step back. My life is not sweet. God's work is sweet. I don't value my life. As soon as he said that, all the other church members of the children stood in front of the walls. You go to our bodies. You don't touch our church. The workers got off the bulldozers and they said, we cannot do that. The police got on the bulldozers, we are going to kill you and destroy your church. And they said to the workers, can you teach us how to drive this thing? And the workers said, nope, suit yourself. <laughs> the police got so angry, they didn't know how to drive the bulldozers. So they said, we got to make you pay. Somebody has to pay so you'll never do it again. So they took my father to the police. And as they took my father to the police station, they called the mayor. What should we do with this guy? He brings Bibles. He builds churches. He, what should we do to these people? And the mayor said, kill him. Make him an example. Kill him. Shoot him. 
And the police officer hung up the phone and said, I'm so sorry, I have to kill you. Don't apologize. Let me pray. Oh, don't you pray for your life, we will not spare you. Oh, no, you got it wrong. I'm not praying for my life. I want to pray for your life. <laughs> and my father gave him a hug and said, Lord, would you forgive him? He doesn't know what he does. And I, I, I really want this, Lord. I'm willing to give my life, but I want you to save this guy. I want to be with him in heaven. And the police officer said, I'm so sorry, I have to kill you. Don't, don't apologize. You do your job. I pray for you. <laughs> then he put the gun here, and my father said, hold on a second. Let me take off the shirt. Oh, no, you don't need to. The bullet goes to the shirt. Oh, I know that. But there are many poor people who don't have a shirt. I don't want you to stain it. Take it. Now you can shoot me. <laughs> and the police officer shook his head. You are crazy. Yes, God's wisdom is foolishness for you guys. But let me tell you, you are crazy because you don't know my God. And in that moment, the telephone started to ring. So the police officer took the telephone, and it was the deputy of the city, the one under the mayor. And he says, don't you touch this guy. Why? After the mayor gave the command that you execute him, the mayor got in his car and left the city hall. And in the moment he got out of the city hall, a drunk truck driver hit the mayor car and killed the mayor. Don't you touch this guy because God's presence, God's spirit is over them. I want to leave. Let him go home. <laughs> My father came home and said, well, if I would have died, would have been a second to resurrection, I would have seen Jesus. But if I live, I guess I have to build more churches. Let me ask you folks, what it would be if we all show that type of commitment. Very soon, very soon, regardless who is in power in politics, the prophecy is clear. Very soon, you'll not be able to buy and to sell. Very soon, we will witness the final events. Very soon, we will see Jesus on the clouds. Are you ready? If not, when are we going to be ready? Oh, tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. I believe I told you the story like a million times. I could put it on the screen. When I was young, first, second grade, I would walk to school, and I would go to the marketplace, and there was a guy from Turkey that he moved in Romania with his family. His name was Bayram Hassan. He sold ice cream. He said he had uh, uh, chocolate ice cream, uh, if I remember right, vanilla ice cream and pistachio ice cream. And the guy screamed from morning to night, loud, every day, all my life, every time I passed by, he was screaming, today you pay, tomorrow is free. <laughs> I got my ice cream, I paid for it, I went next day, I said, I want my free ice cream. Son, today you pay, tomorrow is free. I said, no, 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 no. I came yesterday that was today. Now I came today that is tomorrow. Son, you messed it up. Today is today. Tomorrow is tomorrow. Today you pay. <laughs> I paid again. I came next day. I came tomorrow. Give me my face. No, nah, you came today again. Today you pay. You need to come tomorrow. I said, come on, man. When is tomorrow? He says, son, tomorrow never comes. <laughs> Why do we think that we will prepare tomorrow? Satan loves when we decide to get ready tomorrow. I'm going to pray tomorrow. I'm going to study tomorrow. I'm going to serve tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. The Bible says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Don't play games with the Holy Spirit. It's your salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Today, you follow me? Choose today. There is no tomorrow. If you really want it, if you mean it, don't do it. If you do it tomorrow, it means that you have other priorities. Whatever is your priority, that's your God. Hello? You are quiet. <laughs> Jesus is coming. And he expects 100% commitment. 98% commitment is going to burn in the fire. God doesn't share the heart with Satan. They don't live together. Either he takes the whole thing... Or if you say, oh, I give you 98%. No, you actually don't give anything. Who is not with me is against me. Either all or nothing. And so, 
Jesus is coming and we need to be ready. The question is, how do you get ready? How do you get ready? We started Thursday night to talk about that. We talked about Abraham by faith. You remember? And there are, there are a few quotations, steps to Christ, that says about righteousness, about salvation, about growth. She says, money cannot buy it. Intellect cannot procure it. Human efforts are not enough to do it. There is no way that by your own efforts you can be sanctified, righteous, saved. There is no way, she says, but God gives it to you. But let me, I have a few questions for you before we start. Mm -hmm. Before we start. <laughs> I have a few, yeah, well, well, yeah. I have a few questions for you. Is it good to be baptized? Yes, praise the Lord. If you didn't, you must. The Bible says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You remember? Is it good to be baptized? Yes. Is it enough to be baptized? No. Is it good to have a baby? Yeah, we got a baby celebration. Is it enough to have the baby being born? The baby needs to grow. If the baby doesn't grow, you better go to the doctor. If you have a baby that is 40 years old and still a baby, in diapers, there is something wrong with the baby. Why we in the church think that it's sufficient to have a baptism and then we stop growing? Well, let me talk about how preparation for the second coming happen. Let me talk about that today. It is not sufficient to receive the Holy Spirit when you get baptized. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit every day. Because there is no salvation, no growth, no victory, no sanctification, no nothing without the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to the disciples, it's better for you if I go, because if I go, I will send you the comforter. And he will convict you of this, this, you remember? And then Jesus told the disciples, do not go. Do not work. Stay in the city and pray, and pray, and pray, and pray. How long should we pray, Jesus? Pray. How long? Pray, don't stop, pray forever until you receive the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, he says, you'll receive power. The Greek word dunamis that we have the word dynamite from. you receive power. They come together. When the Holy Spirit comes, power comes. The Holy Spirit is not uh, arthritis. Ah, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. I'm so old. When the Holy Spirit comes, power comes. And then Jesus says, then go. The disciples obeyed. They went in the upper room and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed until they received the Holy Spirit. When they received the Holy Spirit, Miracles happened, 3,000, 5,000 a day. The Bible says that the church clerk got tired to call everybody and say, tell me your name, your address, your date of birth, to put it in the church books. And the whole night I did like 3,285 people, and, and, and then 5,000 got baptized next day, and I just don't have time. So the Bible says, instead of saying 3,000 a day, 5,000, it says, God added daily to their numbers. Can you grasp the word daily? If you had a 3,000 Baptist today, a 5,000 Baptist tomorrow, a 586 Baptist next, a Monday, Tuesday, every day. Wow! Is it possible? Oh, absolutely. Jesus says, he who believes in me will do greater works than I did. Hello, did you hear that promise? Do you believe that promise? The spirit of prophecy says that the work is going to close with greater power than it started. Where is that power? We go to a church, and Jesus loves me, this I know. Yeah. Wake up! <laughs> Where is the power? The reason we don't have power, can it be, is because we don't have the Holy Spirit. Eleanor talks about Alpha and Omega crisis, and she says, Alpha, during Kellogg, pantheism, God was everywhere. In this pulpit, in this, in that chair, because God created and he is in you, he's God everywhere. And she says, Omega crisis, a lot of programs, but God nowhere. Can it be that we got to the point that we confused the programs with the presence? 
We have a lot of programs, but we lack the power. Where is the power? Where are the baptisms? Where is the transformation? Where is the victory? How many sermons have you heard in a lifetime? How many camp meetings? How much tofu have you eaten? Yet, we don't have power. It takes the Holy Spirit to get the power. We need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need the latter rain. Jesus is coming. We need the latter rain. And so, let me say this. The disciples received the Holy Spirit and received power. After they received power, baptisms, miracles, Peter would walk and his shade would go, no, shadow, English, uh, shadow would go over sick people and they would be healed. You remember? Well, we need to grow to that level. It's not enough to be born. We need to mature. We need to grow to the statue of measure of fullness of Christ. We need to grow. We need to grow. Birth is not the end of the story. Birth is the beginning of the story. Baptism is not the end of the story. Baptism is the beginning. Jesus is coming again, and he is calling you to get ready to grow, to be filled with his spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the spirit? It means that you not only sing, but you live it. And he walks with me, and he... It means that continually, 24-7, you are connected. Continually, you are filled. Not only you get a little spirit, you are filled by the spirit. It means that you continually depend on God, not on self. You don't talk what you want, you talk what he says. You don't do what you want, you do what he says. You are continually led by the spirit. For instance, for instance, a couple of examples. I have a friend somewhere in the north, Michigan. I'm going to tell you where, but not more than that. And he said, Pastor, I want to be filled by the Spirit. I want to be baptized with a fresh daily baptism of the Spirit. I want to be led by the Spirit. I want to be one with the Spirit. I want God to lead me as he led Abraham, as he led Enoch. Those people walked with God. Ellen White talks at the end of Desire of Ages, and she says, Enoch, Abraham, they walked with God. And then she says, comma, they are continually connected, aware of God's presence, depending on God, not on self. I put it in my words. What does it mean to walk with God? Continually connected. You follow me? And my friend said, I want to be filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit. And he said, what you preached, it's what I pray every morning that God would fill me, lead me, control me. He called me later. I said, you know, since I prayed that prayer, things started to happen in my life. I've been an Adventist all my life, and nothing happened before. I just did the routine. Go to church, sing Kumbaya, listen to the sermon, go home. But now, since I prayed that prayer, he said to me, isn't it beautiful that God promised his spirit to those who ask? He says... If you who are evil give good gifts to your children, how much more your Father in heaven is going to give his spirit to those who ask? All you need to do is to ask. God wants to give his spirit. It's just that we don't care too much to receive the Holy Spirit. And he said, since I prayed that prayer, God actually keeps his promise. I said, I don't believe it. Why not? Give me a story and then I believe it. If you don't have a story, then it's just theory, theology. He said, well, I'll give you a story. Last week, I was driving through snow. You say Michigan, you say snow. It's no, it snows only one time a year, but that snow lasts nine months, you know. It's like you say Chicago, you say wind. It blows only twice a year, six months from the east and six months from the west. <laughs> he said, I was driving through snow, three days and three nights of snow on Interstate I-94. And he says, I was driving through snow. Instead of listening to stupid news, bad news, instead of listening to bad music, instead of doing business, I change my habits. When I drive, I pray for God's presence with me through the day. So I was praying, Lord, fill me with the Spirit. Lead me, use me. Make me a blessing. Help me be like Abraham. Help me walk with you. Live in me, Jesus. And he said, as I was praying, God impressed me. 
strongly, go look to the right. So he says, I look to the right. When I look to the right, in the field, far away, I see a bump. He says to his wife, I'm not going to tell you her name or his name. Honey, far in the field, there is a bump, white. She says, honey, the whole field is white, is knowing, and the whole field has bumps. He says, no, 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 no. There was a bump that is different than the other bumps. He goes to the no U-turn on the interstate. He turns around, goes to the previous exit, turns around, and comes very slow, looking. And he, sure enough, sees far away a bump white in the field. He stopped on the shoulder, put the hazard lights, and then he walked to that place. When he gets there, down in the field, an old man, gray hair, white robe, robe, sorry, English, robe, white robe, snowed over, covered with snow. And he had something here that said his name and Alzheimer's. Poor man left nursing home to go home and forgot how to get home. And he fell and he was snowed over, frozen. My friend took him on his arms, ran to the SUV, put him in the car, ran to the first hospital, and the doctor said, you got there in the last moment. Two minutes late would have been too late. You saved his life. The doctor called the daughter of the old man. The daughter comes and says, I'm so glad you didn't hit him with the car. He said, he was not on the interstate. He was far in the field, covered with snow. She says, really? By the road? No, far in the field, covered with snow. Then how did you see him? Because people drive, focus on the road, they are on the cell phone, think about problems. Uh, how did you see him covered in the snow far? He said, well, if I tell you, you think that I am crazy. Tell me. I keep praying that God leads me, inspires me, talks to me, fills me with his spirit, uses me, makes me a light, makes me a blessing. And God spoke to me and said, look to the right, and that's how I saw him. She says, I want to join your church. He said, but you don't know what we believe. I don't care. Whatever you believe, I believe. But, but, but we, 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 we don't worship on Sunday, we worship on Saturday. I don't care if you worship Tuesday. I worship when you worship. Why, why do you want to join my church? Because the other churches have the theory, but they don't have God. You have God's presence. Filled by the Spirit. What if all of us would pray that prayer every day? Lord, would you take over me today? What if we did that? Well, we need, we are a slide too. We need, we have uh, 54 slides. We need to really make progress here. <laughs> how, how do you get filled by the Spirit? How do you grow from baby to spiritual maturity? How do you become more like Jesus? How do you get ready for the second coming? How do you experience revival and power and results and the fruit of the Spirit? How do you get ready? How does it happen? Let me explain. I'm going to give you quick, I don't know quick, but anyway. I'm going to give you, I will try quick, the, the ten virgins parable from a revival preparation perspective. It is essential for our salvation. It's absolutely crucial, vital, essential for our salvation to understand this. If you want to be saved, you must understand this. We know the story. The kingdom of heaven is like ten virgins who took their lamps and they went to meet. You remember the story? Five for wise, five for foolish. I have a question. Who are the foolish? The church or the world? The church. We'll talk about that later. And uh, they all had lamps, they all had oil, they all had light, and they, uh, they started to wait for the groom. But then the groom seemed to be late, and the foolish fell asleep or all fall, fell asleep? How many fell asleep? The whole church? You're kidding me. Everybody? Well, let me read you a quotation. Listen carefully. I'm not going to put it on the screen. We don't have time. Just listen carefully. By the sleeping disciples is represented the sleeping church before God's day of visitation. When? Right before Jesus comes. Is represented the sleeping church. Listen carefully. When the day of God's visitation is near, when there is darkness and clouds, when to be found asleep is dangerous. This is Second Testimonies, page 205. 
Now another quotation and then I move on. Christ is at the door. Men and women are in the very last hours of probation. Yet they are careless and foolish. And the preachers have no power to wake them up because the preachers themselves sleep. Ooh. Sleeping ministers preaching to sleeping members. Wow, that's Gospel Workers, page 121. It's like everybody's nodding, the whole church, you know? Wonderful, huh? Everybody, this is sad. We are awake, and before Jesus comes, we fall asleep. That's not the time to fall asleep. But Satan wants us to be ignorant of the signs, so we are not ready. But this is the time when you must be awake. And so, listen carefully. At the midnight, the parable says that there was a cry, a, a virus, a catastrophe, a collapse in economy, something that said, hey, Jesus is coming. And guess what happened with the virgins? How many of them woke up? Do you notice something? They all have lights. They all have oil. Even the foolish. They didn't have enough reserve. But in the beginning, they did have oil. When they got baptized 28 years ago, they did have the spirit and the heart. In the beginning, they have the same. No difference. They all fall asleep. They all wake up. No difference. You, don't, you cannot distinguish between. Uh, they all wake up. But the, the, the foolish didn't have enough oil. That's the single difference. It's not enough to go to church. It's good. Don't get me wrong. It's not enough to go to care meeting. It's not enough to eat healthy. It's not enough to know the doctrines. It's not enough to return tithe. Those are good things. But it's not enough. You must... It's not enough to have oil when you get baptized. You must be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Because only the Holy Spirit can get you ready. If you fail at a certain point in your Christian life to be filled again with the Holy Spirit... You lost everything. And so, Israel, they left Egypt, everybody, but only two from that generation entered the promised land. It's not enough to start well. You must also finish well. Let me give you an example. When, when, I, was, when I was young, I was about 17, 18, we, the whole youth and the pastor, went to the Black Sea for a week. And there is a, a lake called Tekirgyol. That lake is gigantic. Uh, it, it's about 11, 12 kilometers long and about 6, 7, 8 kilometers wide and extremely salty. I mean, you can lay on your back and read the newspaper on the lake and you don't sink extremely salty. And the pastor said to the youth, are you co courageous enough to cross the whole lake? That length that on the other side of the lake, you see the home so small. Are you courageous enough to cross it swimming? And everybody, yeah, ambitious young people. The pastor took a big boat and all the others. And as soon as somebody would get tired, they would get in the boat. And we started. And those wonderful Christians say, chum, 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 chum. Shh. And they, <laughs> you know. My father told me, it's not how you start the race. It is how you finish that counts. And he said to me, son, you need to have a power from outside to always maintain you. He would say to me, every time when I tried to do it, I failed. But when I learned to seek God's power, I never failed. You need to be filled with the power from outside because your power is not good enough. So I did that. I said, Lord, I know it's just a swimming contest, but would you give me strength and power to finish the race? And it came in my mind that you need to be consistent daily. So I said, I'm going to be consistent continually, and I'm going to impose myself a rhythm that I will do it at every second. And I started to sing a song. Pam, 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 pam. I was the slowest one. I told, pam, 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 pam. And the other, and I got there, I caught him from behind. Pam, 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 pam. And the other, shh, shh. You know? Eventually, they got tired one by one, got in the boat. Six kilometers later, I was alone. Pam, 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 
Pam, pam, pam. Hey, Pavel, don't you get in the boat, you are alone. Nah, I want to finish the race. Pam, 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 pam. We cross the lake, all in the boat, me in the water. After we cross the lake, they say, you want to get in the boat to go back? Nope. Pam, 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 back in the water. Pam, pam, pam. I cross that way, that way. Single one, finish the race. Now, let me ask you, folks, how do you know that you are going to finish the race? Wouldn't it be sad to be an Adventist all your life and yet miss heaven? You must be filled with oil. The decision, the decisive factor between saved and lost was not that they didn't know the doctrines, was not that they didn't go to church, was not that they didn't keep Sabbath. It was that they didn't have oil. The presence of the Holy Spirit is what decides your eternity. Unless you are daily filled with oil, you will not make it. And so, Israel, they started well, but only two entered. We so many times are happy that we start well, and during the trip, we forget, get distracted, get busy, fall asleep. Eventually, what happens, we don't watch. We did have oil, we did have fire when we got baptized. Fire, light in the lamp. But the fire, because we don't fill the reserve container daily, the oil from the lamp started to slowly go down. So slow that you don't even notice. You still have oil, you still have fire, but it's less and less and less. You cannot eat today forever. You need to eat tomorrow again. You cannot drink water today forever. You cannot breathe now forever. As you need to eat continually, you need to be filled with the Spirit continually. That's your spiritual life. Basically, the, fire, the oil started to go lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. And they fell asleep when they woke up. They didn't even know that they don't have oil. Because, oh, we don't have oil. Can it be that the oil goes so slow, lower and lower, that we don't know when it goes off? Therefore, you must daily be filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit so your container is always full. Let me uh, jump a little. This is very sad. In the parable, five are in and five are out. And only those that have oil are ready, prepared for the second coming. God wants us to be ready. And to be ready means to be filled with the Spirit. We cannot do it in human power, wisdom. Spirit of prophecy, steps to Christ 49. I told you before, money cannot, die, intellect cannot procure it, wisdom cannot attain it. You can never hope in your efforts to secure it. It is only by God's presence. When you believe that God keeps his promise, the Holy Spirit starts to work in your life. The Holy Spirit fills you with his presence. And you are born again and keep growing. In my words, it steps to Christ, page 51. To be ready is not to be part of the church. That's good, but not enough. To be ready is to be daily filled with the Spirit. Let me ask you, how much do you pray daily for the fresh baptism of the Spirit? Can it be that Satan wants us to be ignorant to the need for the Holy Spirit so we are not ready? The Spirit was poured over the early church to prepare the starting of the work. The Spirit is going to be poured over the last church, latter rain, to finish the work. If you don't receive the Spirit today, why do you think you are going to receive the Spirit tomorrow? I want you to imagine, as I said yesterday, Joshua making a plan to take Jericho. No success. It was the Holy Spirit that gave him the plan and the power and the victory. I want to give you a quick, quick story. Uh, we do have a little time, too. We, we, we are in slide seven. That's progress. I want to give you a little story. In Kenya, two years ago, at the annual council in October, at the general conference, there were reports like every year. And one of the reports, and I put it in my words, was this. In Kenya, God's work, the church, grows very fast. 
I don't remember the percentage, 25, 30, 50 percent, I don't remember. But in Nairobi, in the capital, it's growing very slow, like 3.2 percent, because Nairobi is very business-oriented, very secular. All the business, all the money from the whole country happens in Nairobi. That's a big city, 11 million people. That's a big city. And the church got together. What can we do to grow the church also in Nairobi? And they said, it's not going to happen. The Spirit of Prophecy says that the greatest need that we have is revival, and that happens when the Spirit comes, and the Spirit comes when we pray for the Spirit. So they, a group of pastors, decided to pray for revival, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Nairobi to reach Nairobi. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed a month, two months, every night. I don't remember how long, half an hour, one hour. A group, a small group of pastors prayed every night. After a few months, they got a phone call. Uh, I am so-and-so. I am a non-denominational pastor, and I discovered that Sabbath is not Sunday, it's Saturday. So I googled, and I learned that you keep Sabbath. Would you please send me some materials to learn more about Sabbath? Sure. They sent him Bible studies. He studied. He called back. I want to be baptized. Okay. They baptized him. He went back to his two churches, gave the whole two churches, I don't know how many members, six, seven thousand, I don't know, six hundred, uh, gave Bible studies to his two churches, and most of his members got baptized. But he said, this is the best news ever. Jesus is coming, and we want to be ready, and it's my duty to tell everybody. So every six months, all pastors of all denominations, about 2,000 of them from Nairobi, get together to share resources. When the pastors from Nairobi, roughly 2,000 pastors, got together, this guy, non-denominational pastor, just got baptized, made 2,000 copies of the Bible studies, and he gave to every non-Adventist pastor a copy. And he said, I'm going to share with you my story. This is what I discovered after I prayed, and this is how my life has been changed. And after he shared his testimony, I don't remember the number. If I remember, around 190-some pastors, non-Adventist pastors, 195, 196, don't quote me, over 190 non-Adventist pastors got baptized. And they went to their churches, and many, 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 I don't know the number, that's the reason I stay away from numbers, 30,000, 50,000, a million, I don't know. Many of their churches got baptized as a result of a group praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God can do what you cannot imagine. You cannot even grasp and pray for God can do with amazing, unbelievable power. If that's what we depend on for our personal growth, for our personal salvation, readiness, or for the church growth, why don't we pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? The, the virgins, all ten were virgins. In the Bible, the woman is the symbol for the church. All ten were virgins, the, the, the pure church. All ten were in white, not like the, 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 the woman in scarlet. In white means they had Jesus' righteousness. All ten, not only five. All ten believed in the doctrine. All ten went to church and ate broccoli. All ten were waiting for the groom. Parousia, the, the Adventist church. We are, what means Adventist? We are waiting. They all, by the way, how do you know that you are waiting? What do you do to know that you are waiting? Because if you look to the church and to the society, there is no difference. In Christian service, in chapter 4, she says, instead of the church converting the world, the world has converted the church to the point that there is no line of demarcation. How do you know that you are waiting? What do you do? And so, all ten were waiting. All ten had lamps. Thy word is a lamp. And they had the word. They had the commandments. That's God's church. All ten had the lamps, all ten had oil, the Holy Spirit. When they got baptized, they received the Holy Spirit. you remember? All ten 
went to sleep, all ten woke up. There is no difference between them. However, five of them didn't have enough oil at the end. Many who come to church will not make it. Five in, five out. One taken, one left. So what is the problem with the foolish? What is the problem with the foolish? What is the problem with the foolish? Let me explain a little about sleeping. They were sleeping. You know what sleep is in the Bible? It's the symbol for security, for safety. Jesus was sleeping in the boat. Though it was storm, he knew that he's in the Father's hands. The Spirit of Prophecy says he knew that he is safe. Sleeping means a sense of safety. All ten are sleeping. It's that false sense of security that we have. We are God's church. We know the doctrines. We keep the Sabbath. We, you follow me? A false sense of security based on forms instead of relationship. Because they all have the lamps. What is the lamp? The lamp is the form that holds the content, the oil. They all have the lamps. They all have the forms. They all have the routine. And the routine makes them feel secure. They have replaced the relationship with the routine. They have a formal religion without the power of transformation. And because they have the lamps, the forms, they don't notice that there is no oil inside, and they feel okay, and they go to sleep. A false sense of security. If there is no oil, there is no fire. There is no light, there is no energy, there is no growth, there is no transformation, there is no salvation, there is nothing. There is no fruit, because it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, it's not your fruit. How do you know if you are ready? How do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? The Bible is very plain. Jesus says, you will know them by their fruit. What is the fruit? Very simple. You go to Galatians chapter 5, in the first part of the chapter, it gives the fruit of the flesh. And in the second part, he gives you the fruit of the Spirit. So let me explain. Stop trying to produce the fruit of the Spirit. You'll never manage. If you are a banana tree, you can try forever to make apples. Mm, I'm trying. You'll still make bananas. You need to be an apple tree to make apples. You cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit because it is what you hear. The fruit of the Spirit is not yours. Instead of trying to produce the fruit of the Spirit, you need to be filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit in you will produce the fruit of the Spirit. Instead of praying, Lord, help me produce fruit, you should say, Lord, fill me with oil, because this is crucial. Daily, baptize me fresh with the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, have you been baptized? Yes. With water or the Holy Spirit? Uh, only Apollos baptism with water. You need to be baptized again. You need to be baptized with spirit, it says in the New Testament, and fire. They go together. Every Bible verse you say, spirit and fire. They don't go separated. John says, I baptize you with water, but he who comes after me baptizes you with spirit and? Well, let me ask you a question. When you go in the water, how do you come out? Wet. When you go in the fire, how do you come out? Hot. Well, if you are not hot for the Lord, you have never been baptized with the Spirit. Ellen White says that those that have been truly converted, they have a zeal, a passion for Jesus, a passion for prayer, a passion for saving the lost. And she says, if you don't have that zeal, that fire, she says, that fire that burns you from inside, you have never been converted. Whoa! How do you know them? They lack the fire. They go to church, but they are sleeping. They lack the fire. They lack the passion. They lack the fruit. And whatever you do, you'll never be able to change it unless the Spirit is in you. When the Spirit comes, when oil comes, fire doesn't exist in the lamp in the absence of oil. Do you follow me? There is no fire without oil. In order for you to have fire, to have energy, to be a light, you need to be filled with the Spirit. The oil, the Holy Spirit, is what starts, ignites the fire, maintains the fire, maintains the light, 
brings the fruit, gets us ready for the second coming. I tell this in my sermons. My grandmother had a magnifying glass that she would read the Bible with. And she would move it up and down, and the letters were bigger and smaller. She would read it. As soon as she would go to cook or something, I would steal the magnifying glass and go outside and put straw and then put the magnifying glass and focus really well until the straw got on fire. Let me explain it. Whatever you focus on, that's what you get on fire for. If you focus on politics, you are going to be on fire for politics. If you focus on your girlfriend, you are going to be on fire for your girlfriend. If you focus on business or money, you are going to be on fire for money. But if you focus on Jesus, you are going to be on fire for Jesus. Because whatever is your treasure, that's where your heart will be. What does it stress you when you go to sleep? Because if Jesus doesn't stress you, you don't have the Holy Spirit. What do you pray for when you pray? Because if you don't pray for the Holy Spirit, you will be lost. Remember, the coin is lost in the house. You can be in the church and still be lost and not know. Hello? Because the Bible talks about Laodicea and says that they are not hot. They are not cold. They are lukewarm. They are not on fire. We need the Holy Spirit to be on fire for God, to see the members burning, not sleeping. Jesus is coming. It's time to wake up. It's time to get ready. We look around, and you must be blind not to see the signs of the second coming. Jesus is coming. We need to get ready. Jesus is calling you. Oh, when the church is revived, I'm going to get revived. No, don't wait for the church. The church is not the building. The church is not the institution. The church is the people. It's you and me. Jesus is calling you to get filled with the Spirit, to get on fire for preparation, for second coming, for his kingdom, for mission, to be on fire, to burn. He says that the passion for your house is like a fire. You remember in the Bible? Do you have that passion in your heart? I want to jump from slide 9 to slide 52. <laughs> Our time is up, unfortunately. We didn't go through everything, but that's okay. I'm going to jump quick here. So many times, because we have the lamps, the doctrines, the forms, the routine, the programs, we feel safe. And we confuse the lamps with the oil, the forms with the fire, with the presence. We must be baptized with the Holy Spirit every day. I want you to understand. Okay, hold on a second. This is very important. I need to read this. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. What is that? Have you read this Bible verse before? Well, let me explain what it is. He will convict you of sin. That's conversion. The Holy Spirit converts you. It's called justification. We get baptized, converted, justified, and we stop. That's the problem. That's the reason we are not ready. Because the Holy Spirit needs to also convince you of righteousness. And that's growth. After you get baptized, you need to grow. He will convict you of righteousness. That's sanctification. And then he will convict you of judgment. That's glorification. The Holy Spirit works the whole process from conversion to salvation. And without the Holy Spirit, there is no step, there is nothing. I'm going to jump a little more here. Uh, you remember the, the Bible verse, Son of Man, in Ezekiel 33, I'm not going to go through it. Your people go to church and they listen to you like a nice music, but they don't do your words. They fail. They listen, but they fail to implement it. Folks, we should not be only listeners. When the Holy Spirit appeals to you to do something about it, don't play games with the Holy Spirit. It's our salvation at stake. When the Holy Spirit says, today start praying, today start praying. If the Holy Spirit says, today, you need to start studying consistently, do it. 
If the Holy Spirit says today you need to serve, do it. Because when God calls you to do it, he is going to do it for you in his power. You don't need to worry how. You just need to worry to say yes. Because it's not in your power. He who calls you, he will enable you. But you need to be willing to say yes. You need to say every morning, Lord, I really want it. Would you do it for me? We must respond to his invitation. I'm going to jump to a few quotations and we finish. Tozer says, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of our programs would go on and nobody would know the difference. However, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the First Testament church, 95% of all their programs would have stopped and everybody would have known that the Holy Spirit left. Isn't that something? A revival of true godliness is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek that should be our first work. Now listen carefully. Earnest prayer. Earnest prayer. Earnest prayer. A revival needs to be expected only in answer to prayer. Lord, fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit, the knowledge of the world, prophecies, doctrines, the knowledge of the world is of no avail. The theory, unaccompanied by the Spirit, cannot sanctify the heart. You may be familiar with all the doctrines, but unless the Spirit would set it home, the character will not be transformed. There is no transformation without the Spirit. We will not be able to distinguish false from error. This is powerful. Ten virgins, some of them, five had oil, some didn't. So with the church before second coming, all have a knowledge of the scripture, all wait for the second coming, but some of them have no spirit. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand, it is absolutely crucial for our salvation, preparation, finish the work, to seek the presence of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. They have been content with a superficial work. Their service to God degenerates into a form. Wow. Many will say, Lord, 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 we've been going to church. And Jesus says, I don't know you. Saddest of all words, I don't know you. The fellowship of the Spirit which you have slighted could alone make you ready for the marriage feast. Wow. Hold on a second. I'm okay. In this life, they have not entered into fellowship with Christ. Therefore, they don't know the language of heaven. I got to jump to the last slide. I got to jump here. Give me a second, prophetic second. It was shown, listen, the state of God's professed people. Many of them were in darkness, insensitive to their true condition, benumbed in regard to spiritual and eternal things. Wow. Having idols in their hearts. Oh. If God is to bless his church in the last days, it will be because of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Not only to be studied, but sought after with the whole heart. Ministers and congregations will be found bowing before God with one cry. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. We have tried to be Christians with as little as possible of the Holy Spirit. We have not sought to be church filled with the Holy Spirit. If we don't have the Spirit, it was better to close the churches. God has mercy on us. Have mercy. If our ministers don't have the Holy Spirit, you better stop preaching. I think I don't speak too strongly when I say a church in the land without the Spirit is rather a curse than a blessing. Whoa. Since this is the means by which we are to receive power, why don't we hunger, thirst for the Spirit? Why don't we talk about it, pray about it, preach about it? The Lord is more willing to give His Spirit than parents give, give gifts to the children. The daily, daily, is not enough to receive it when you're baptized. Daily, continue, the daily baptism of the Spirit, every worker, should offer petitions to God for it. Companies of Christians should gather together and especially they should pray that God will baptize them with the Holy Spirit. 
Wow. If there was ever a time when we need a spirit, it is now. I'm going to stop right here. Aren't you happy? <laughs> In the measureless gift of the Holy Spirit are contained all heaven's resources. It is not because of any restriction on the part of God that we don't receive that. If we are willing to receive it, God will fill us with his spirit. Did I tell you about the earthquake? I did, didn't I? In 1977. I did? No? Yes? Do that? No? Okay. In 1977, March 4th, there was an earthquake in Romania. Uh, 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 I believe it was 7.4 on Richter scale, 1 minute and 16 seconds. Many buildings collapsed. Many people, I don't remember, around tw over 24, 25,000 people perished. Buildings collapsed, people were buried alive. And I remember, people were screaming, elevators stopped functioning, people were going down the stairs. And in, among tall buildings, even if people got out, they had no place to run, and the buildings dropped over them. And as people were screaming, my mom, during the earthquake, was screaming, Lord, if I die, please forgive all my sins. I want to be saved. My father started to sing. Rock of ages cleft for me. And my, father, my mother said, how can you sing? And my father, I open my mouth and it comes. <laughs> and my mom says, how do you know that you are ready? And my father says, I don't wait until the crisis to pray. I pray every day and make sure that I am ready every day. And my father said, people who pray desperately in crisis is because they don't pray all the time. People who are filled with God's presence all the time, they don't need to panic in crisis. In that moment, somebody knocked in the door. Tum, 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 tum. Who is knocking in the door during the earthquake? My father opens the door. Our next door neighbor. Mr. Goya, can we come in? Why would you want to come in? We are in a tall building at the fourth story. Why, do you, why don't you run out? In the building is not safe. Outside is not safe. The buildings fall on people. This is the single safe place in the whole area. How do you know that this is the single safe place in the neighborhood? Well, every time when we fight, argue, watch TV, you folks pray, sing. You go to the neighbors and give them vegetables. You pray with the neighbors. We can see the Spirit of God over your house. We can see the Spirit of God over you. You are filled with God's presence. God is in your house. Heaven is in your house. This is the single safe place. Can we come in? Come in. Let's sing the song. We don't know the song. I'm going to tell you the words. Rock of ages, clap for me. Rock of The earthquake stopped. My father had a prayer for them. And then he said to them, folks, you go home. But don't you wait for the next crisis. Make sure that you invite God's presence every day. So your place, your home, will be heaven too. You don't wait for the crisis to prepare for the crisis. You are filled with God's Spirit today and tomorrow and every day, and that's how you are ready. God is calling you to do that. Would you start that today? Let's pray together. Oh, they told me not to pray now. I'm going to pray. They will forgive me. <laughs> Father in heaven, what an important thought that there is nothing we can do to grow, to produce fruit, to get ready for the second coming, to finish the work. Nothing that we can do unless your spirit does it for us. Help us to understand. Satan wants us to be ignorant, to be distracted, to be busy to the point that we don't think about it. Help us to be awake. Help us to daily seek your presence more than anything, more than life. Help us to be daily baptized with a fresh baptism of the Spirit. Help us to be filled with oil. Help us to pray that prayer every day and to trust that you keep your promise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
cannot tell why he who angels worship should set his love upon the souls of men or why as stays our sins and calms our lurking fear and lifts the burden from the heavy laden for this the Savior I cannot tell how all the lands shall worship when at his bidding every storm is still. Savior, Savior of the world is known. And this I know, the sky shall sound his praises. At last, my Savior, Savior of the world is Let's pray together. Lord, wake us up. Help us to be all in, 100% committed to you. Lord, we've been blessed and inspired today by music and by your word. Now, as we leave this place, give us the courage and the commitment to
to pray for your spirit each and every day, that we and all of our churches can be on fire for you and be ready for your coming. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And to our viewing audience, we just want to remind you, our next meeting is at 545 with Sandy. And I have to tell you, I was really touched. My Irish heritage, you know what I was thinking, Danny boy. But I've never heard Danny boy sound so beautiful in all my life. Beautiful, beautiful song. Thank you. 545. And then our final installment, if you will, of 2021 camp meeting will be with Pablo Goya again at 7 o'clock. And just a few shout outs, West Valley Philam, a brand new group is watching live. Uh, Lily Marie from Palestine, Texas. Josh Fad from Mesa. Sergio is watching. Sergio Moreta, who helps us with our sound, is watching with his entire church at Chandler Brazilian. And then Ray Navarro at Tempe. And two of our people, uh, Rosemary, uh, Rosemary, who works for us, uh, Rosemary, who works with us in the Arizona Conference, and her husband, Scoble, are watching online. And if I miss this one, Mike Soto will kill me. Greg Fortney from Casa Grande, Arizona, is watching us as well. Cody Blake watching with his grandparents, Dr. Leo and Claudine Herber. And then Zach is watching at Scottsdale Thunderbird. And congratulations to Bailey baptized today at Cottonwood Church and Alyssa Tryon baptized today at Paradise Valley Church. God bless you all. Have, be safe. Have a safe trip home. If you're leaving from here, if you're watching at home, have a good lunch. Come back and enjoy us. join us again at 545. God bless. We'll see you soon.